I'll just give. There are still a few people waiting. I'll give them 15 seconds and then I'll start. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so, hello and welcome to the second plenary talk. I hope you all had a pleasant lunch and enjoyed the food and the nice weather. Uh, for somebody coming out of Oslo, which uh, has have had uh, 15 degrees centigrade for the last month, it's not very nice to come here to, to California and finally get a little sunburn. So um, the second plenary speaker uh, is my good colleague uh, Sebastian, who's sitting here. Sebastian Geiger uh, has a, a master degree from Oregon um, State University and a PhD degree from Zurich. He is right now the Foundation CMG Chair uh, in Carbon Reservoir Simulation and Head of the Carbon Reservoir Simulation Group at the Institute of Petroleum Engineering at Harriet Watt. So he will be giving a talk today that is called Numerical Simulation of Fracture Reservoir, All Challenges and New Ideas. So I look forward. So please go ahead. Thank you very much, Knut Andreas, for the introduction. First of all, thank you to Siam for the invitation, and also the organizers for putting together this really nice conference. And can just echo how nice it is to be in California and see the sun, because we say in Scotland, summer is the favorite time of the year. It's, uh, uh, summer is our favorite time of the year. It's this one day of summer that we typically have. Um, I want to talk about simulating fractured reservoirs, and I want to do this from a very much applied um, angle. Because fractures are important, if you look at processes such as hydrocarbon production, groundwater vulnerability, groundwater supply, geothermal energy, and also CO2 storage. If you look at carbonate rocks, an area I work in, about 60% of the world's remaining oil is located in carbonate reservoirs. Carbonate aquifers and carbonate formations, they supply groundwater to about 25% of the world's population. There's a lot of talk at the moment to combine CO2 storage with enhanced oil recovery techniques to kill two birds with a stone, get more oil out of the ground, and um, sequester CO2 in the subsurface in carbonate reservoirs. If you look at impermeable rocks, such as shales and mud rocks, typically seals, fractures import for unconventional oil and gas. And if the uh, mud rock or the shales are a seal, for example, above a CO2 storage site, then we're worried about um, leakage of CO2 or other contaminants through fractures in impermeable rocks. Fractures in crystalline basement rocks, they're important for enhanced geothermal systems and again for possible, could be possible leakage pathways if you have, um, if you're planning to build a nuclear waste repository, for example, in, Sweden, in, in Finland, in a basement, um, in basement rocks. Fractures are typically the highways for flow and transport on the subsurface. So what you see here on your right picture is a map view, an aerial view of a fracture pattern that was mapped in, um, in the Hornanen Basin, North Sea, it's a sandstone formation, about 3,000 fractures in this outcrop. It's about 90 meters by 90 meters. Um, what we did is we discretized, using unstructured grids, we discretized each individual fractures and the matrix, and then we solved Dar for Darcy's law and calculated the flow field um, in, this in this formation. You see this on your um, left screen. And the um, colors indicate the flow velocities. It's a logarithmic scale. And you immediately see where the fractures are because they're flowing much, much faster than anything in the um, rock matrix. Nice red colors. 
You know, then continue and say, let's inject numerically um, um, a trace and simulate how the tracer migrates through this fracture, through the fractures in the rock matrix. You see that, again, the tracer is completely refined to the fractures, actually in a small fraction of the fractures, because not all of the fractures are connected. So you have high concentration of tracer, of your contaminant, of your CO2 in the fractures, a low concentration in the matrix. The only process that really, in this particular example, that really exchanges fluid mass and um, dissolved components between the fractures and the rock matrix would be diffusion, which is orders of magnitude slower than the transport through the fractures. What this leads to is sort of a typical flow and transport behavior in fracture geologic formations. On your left-hand side, you see again results from numerical simulation. We've injected a pulse of tracer into a fractured formation. Again, we have both discretized, discretized both the fracture and the rock matrix. We injected this tracer for one day, for 10 days, and for 20 days. You can see that immediately, almost after we've injected, the tracer concentration rises from zero to its maximum concentration. When we shut off the injection, the tracer starts to drop very quickly. But then you have this long tail at light time. So if early breakthrough, tracer rises very quickly for the duration of the injection. Then we stop injection. Tracer drops quite quickly. But then we have these long tails um, at late time. These long tails are due to the slow exchange, diffusive exchange between fractures and rock matrix. And what this allows us to do is, in many but not in all fracture geologic formations, is to apply a separation of scales. We treat processes in the fractures, which happen very fast, differently to processes that happen in the matrix, which are significantly slower. And what this has led to is what I call the workhorse of applied fractured reservoir simulation. It's a dual prosody model that was invented by Warren and Root over 50 years ago. It's mathematically a very elegant model. It's a very simple model. What they simply say is, if our fractured formation, we separate, we apply a separation of scales. So we have the fractures, the flowing domain, where things happen very fast. And then we have the rock matrix, the stagnant domain, that's um, represented here by these sugar cubes. And this rock matrix that simply supplies fluids to the fractures or takes up fluids from the um, fractures and absorbs them in the rock matrix. And what this allows us in our favorite reservoir simulator is to encapsulate, to represent fractures that are below the scale of a simulation grid block using a dual porosity or dual permeability approach. So for a reservoir simulation model, we have our individual grid blocks up here. Then we have fractures that are at the scale well below grid blocks, so grid block maybe 100 by 100 meters, several meters high. Here's your geologist for scale. So this is perhaps two grid blocks high, but a fraction of a grid block in length. And then in the reservoir simulation model, we have fracture grid, a fracture grid here, and, this con and these fracture grids are connected. And this is the flowing domain. And then we have a matrix grid. Um, it's, it can be a stagnant domain, but the matrix can also be flowing with connections between individual matrix grid blocks. We have a transfer function that tells us how fast do the two different domains communicate. The ingredients of the dual porosity model are that we need the fracture properties, most notably the fracture permeability. We need to tell us how fast do things happen in the fractures. We need the matrix properties that tells us how much fluids are stored, are fluids are stored in the rock matrix, how much traces, uh, or how, much, how many contaminants, how quickly are the contaminants absorbed in the rock matrix. And then we need the transfer function that tells us how fast the two different domains interact. I want to talk, what I want to talk about in this, um, discuss in this talk is what are the challenges if we apply the dual porosity model to some real world reservoirs? And what are the opportunities that we have developed over the last 10, 15 years in academia um, to improve some of these challenges that many reservoir engineers face day to day? The key challenge that we face is we almost face in any um, reservoir simulation is we need to define a representative elementary volume where we more strict, um, uh, um, uh, more generally, when we run a reservoir simulation, we assume that somehow magically at the scale of a reservoir simulation grid block, we have a representative elementary volume, which means that properties, for example, permeability, its average doesn't really change over the scale at which we have defined our reservoir simulation grid block. And we sort of make this assumption that this has been done properly when we set up our reservoir simulation model. If you look at data from fracture reservoirs, that's again um, data from outcrops, number of fractures against fracture length in a log-log scale, 
we see that they often follow power law scaling behavior. So this means we have a large number of very short fractures and a small number of very long fractures. So what this means is, as I'm increasing or decreasing the grid blocks of my reservoir simulation model, I'm picking up larger and larger fractures. I may lose some of the larger in, in a single grid block, or um, some of the larger fractures may spend two or three or more grid blocks. So the connectivity of the fractures at the scale of a grid block is changing as I'm increasing or decreasing the size of my grid block. So defining the REV is not that simple in fractured reservoir um, simulations. And Brian Berkowitz um, discussed this very nicely in a classical review paper. He, he said verbatim, fracture systems that exhibit scaling behavior do not possess any homogenization scale. So that, strictly speaking, representative elementary volume cannot be defined. So we run reservoir simulation, we assume we are at the ROV scale in each grid block, but we may not be in a fractured reservoir. The question is, does this matter? When we calculate the effective permeability of a fracture network, a typical way is that we sort of stochastically generate a network of connected fractures. So the fractures could be disks or hexahedral um, elements. You see this up here. And then we use several um, different upscaling techniques to calculate the effective property, most notably fracture permeability, but also fracture porosity, at the scale of a single grid block. So we consider what's the local connectivity of the fractures in this grid block here and we calculate the effective permeability and porosity of the fractures. We can do this analytically, the so-called ODAS method. It's fast, but it assumes infinitely large fractures because it's only based on geometrical arguments. We can do this numerically using flow-based upscaling. It's very slow. It's impractical for any full field applications, but if we use the right um, boundary condition, we can honor the local connectivity of the fractures at the scale of a grid block. And this immediately gets us into trouble because if you take, so randomly pick a grid block here, this is the grid block in yellow, the number of disconnected fractures in there, well, ODA, whoops, sorry, ODA's methods, method, the analytical method, gives us a permeability of 3.4 Darcy because it assumes it's infinitely large fractures. It detects that the fractures are connected at the scale of the grid block. Flow-based upscaling gives us a permeability of zero. We apply this and play this game further, and we look at um, the scale dependency of permeability in entire fracture networks. What you see up here is a discrete fracture network that was built using some real data from a real reservoir, and we looked at lots of images, image logs, et cetera, et cetera, to build to the best of our abilities a fracture network that could represent the fractures that are um, present in the subsurface. We built one single fracture network, so we didn't look at any stochastic realizations and so forth. I always said as we generate a reservoir simulation grid, shown here, we make the grid cells larger and smaller, and we use a different upscaling methods that are available in um, the toolboxes. We do, and then the last step that we did is we calculated using the geometric mean the average permeability of the fractures that we have calculated. So for a discrete fracture network, we generate a grid. At each grid block, we calculate the local fracture permeability, and then we take the average of all fracture cells. What you see here on your left is the average fracture permeability for this reservoir simulation model is a function of the cell size from 10 meter edge length to 100 meter edge length, and is a function of the different upscaling methods, so ODAS method, flow-based methods with different boundary condi um, conditions. See, there's about a factor of five difference in the average permeability. And there's also quite, in some cases, a non-monotonic behavior in how the fra f, um, fracture permeability, the average fracture permeability changes. This is, again, because different upscaling methods react differently as we increase or decrease cell sizes and as the connectivity at the scale of a single reservoir simulation grid block changes. This average fracture permeability, you could envision this as sort of a fracture permeability that is similar to the permeability that you may see in a pumping test, in a well test. If I now try to calibrate my simulation model against data from a well test, I'm already starting out with a factor of five uncertainty simply based on the button that I've clicked in um, a software tool. We play this game further and I look at how the production forecast changes. Again, in a single fracture network, upscaled using different methods, upscaled on different grid blocks, we see that the oil production rate can vary about a factor of two and a half. It may not sound much, but if you're basing your decision of where to, how to design a $1 billion oil platform based 
on uncertainties that are 250% in oil production rates, simply um, that depends on where I click a button in a geomodeling platform, in an upscaling process, that's quite dramatic. If you're interested in groundwater flow and you may want to know how fast um, some contaminants arrive at a drinking well, again, you have a factor of two and a half, something predicts, one model predicts in one year's time, another model in two and a half years' time, simply based on which button I've clicked in my modeling software, I think that's quite dramatic. And it's a key some uncertainty that we may want to deal with. So, what can we do? We can have a night out with a drunken Scotsman. And the reason why I quote the drunken Scotsman is that a classical random walk is typically explained by the drunken sailor who sort of stumbles home from the bar and does randomly step to the left, to the right, to the front, to the back. I've lived in Scotland for 10 years, and the Scottish people, they like to drink, but they behave slightly different. So we have our different from a drunken sailor. So we have our drunken Scotsman with his um, pints in the pub, walks home, and he stops at a fish and chip shop to sober up a little bit, have some fish and chips, and he's not the only one. So he stands in the queue for quite a long time until he starts to move again. As he continues stumbling home, he remembers he's very close to his second favorite pub, so he speeds up to take one final drink for the home, um, on the road, and he sits in the pub, and it takes again some time until he moves. If we were now to map his steps on the grid, they're not just random in space, but every time our drunken Scotsman is moving, the time it takes to make one stop, step varies. So he may be moving relatively slow, and then he doesn't move at all when he reaches um, the fish and chip shop, and then he continues to move, and then he remembers hey, the pub is very close, and he moves quite fast until he reaches the pub, and he starts moving very slow again. What this um, um, random walk, this modified random walk, allows us to do is to model single phase flow using probabilistic transport approaches, such as continuous time random walks in fractured geologic formation. Brian Berkowitz has put this in a much nicer and much more mathematical and physically sound um, basis as I did when I explained this with a drunken Scotsman. Um, he defined this idea of the, or he applied the idea of continuous time random walks, which is a generalized form of random walks to heterogeneous um, geological formations, most notable in many cases to fractured geological formations. Continuous time random walks, they date back um, to the 70s, Harvey Scher um, developed the fundamental idea, and very recently, Ruben Joannes and Peter Kang at um, MIT, some very nice extension to the continuous time random walk application, specifically with respect to fractured geologic formations. What a continuous time random walk does, it, it captures the distribution of these transition times, the time it takes our random, uh, our drunken Scotsman to take one step from the pub back to the road, to the fish and chip shop, and so forth. So it captures the distribution of transition times, psi of t, for a particle to move a fixed distance x. And it does this through memory function. Example memory function is plotted here. Again, note the log log scale. And for example, we could model these memory functions using a truncated power law with different cutoff times. And then um, subtle changes in these truncated power laws, they lead to, again, subtle changes in the breakthrough curve. So this would be concentration as a function of time. We can also calculate the probability for particles to jump during time step delta t, which is down here. And the really nice thing about this approach is it preserves the statistically rare and fast, uh, the statistically rare, fast and slow events. So it preserves the fact that a particle, concentration or volume of fluid, may be stuck in the rock matrix for a very long time until it diffuses back out into the fractures, where it moves very, very quickly until it diffuses back into um, the rock matrix. Very much like our Scotsman, who gets stuck at the fish and chip shop for a long time, then moves very quickly to the next pub, and then gets stuck at the pub for a long time. What this approach does is it allows us to model, for example, single phase flow and fractured geological formations. This is data from a tracer test um, that was done in the fractured basement rocks in Switzerland, concentration against time. If you use continuous time random walks, you get a very nice fit of the data. If you try different upscaling methods, you typically, or in this example, you overpredict um, the breakthrough quite dramatically. What we've recently shown, or not recently, it's about five years ago, you can also apply this continuous time random walk um, approach if you want to model heat flow in fractured geologic formations. So again, what you see here 
is the um, outcrop from the Hornelin basin with the 3,000 fractures. We simulated um, the injection of hot fluids in through this outcrop model. We recorded breakthrough curves um, in, in this geometry. And then the breakthrough curves with these dotted lines, we tried to model them using classical upscale theory, upscaling theories. Is quite a bit off from, um, from the simulated breakthrough curves. If you use a continuous time random walk, we get a very nice match between the simulation and the model. So continuous time random walk, or more generally um, probabilistic transport modeling approaches, they allow us to capture this wide range of transition times um, in complex fractured geological formations for single phase flow. For multi-phase flow, that doesn't work because one of the key assumptions is that the flow field is um, is, doesn't change as a function of the property that's being transported. If you look at multi-phase flow, the flow field changes as the saturation field in the reservoir evolves. So what we can do here is we can try to resolve fractures explicitly using unstructured grids. And many people who have done this, and I think Jerome Jaffre is going to give his um, um, prize lecture tomorrow, on some of the work he has done um, on um, using unstructured grid methods to resolve fractures explicitly in reservoir models. The idea is quite simple in this very different, uh, in this many different variants, is that you have your domain of dimension D, so this could be 2D or 3D, and your fractures are of dimension D minus one. So in the 3D domain, your fractures will be two-dimensional surfaces, and then you use some finite element or finite volume methods that honor the shape of the fractures through unstructured grids. The nice thing that we can then do is we can model complex fractures and geological structures using unstructured grids. So here this is an outcrop image, um, so 350 by 150 meters in size. The vertical lines are fractures, so some big fracture corridors. The horizontal lines are the boundaries between individual sedimentary beds. We can represent this through unstructured finite element grids. See nice where the fractures are and where the um, horizontal, so the sub, um, nearly horizontal um, sedimentary beds are. And what we can then do is we can preserve in our simulation model all the geological structures as we see them in an analog model, an analog geology. We can simulate the relevant flow and transport processes, heat transport, multi-phase flow, three-phase flow, CO2 storage, and so forth. Can then investigate the resulting flow behavior and key control, so we can make the fractures more permeable, less permeable. We can change the wettability of the rock matrix and see how the system behaves. We can compare the results with results from standard upscaling methods, standard dual porosity models, for example. And we can analyze the simulation as uh, the, the limitations of the standard approaches and think of how we can develop new upscaling methods. And there was some very nice work done by Mohamed Karami Fat and Ben Gong here at Stanford University came up with a very nicely improved dual porosity model where they used unstructured grids like this to represent the fracture network explicitly in the subsurface and then developed based on this, uh, on, on the simulation outcome, they be, um, developed a um, much improved dual porosity model. And um, people at Chevron, they did similar approaches where they built entire reservoir models where they represented the fractures some of the fractures explicitly in the subsurface, and then tested how you do um, different upscaling approaches compared to a reference solution that's based on unstructured grids. Now, unfortunately, doing this for the full field reservoir, big reservoirs, tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands, or millions of fractures is not possible. The meshing becomes too complex. The computations become really challenging, if not um, impossible at all. I think the least what we can do with these unstructured grids is that we say, well, we try to honor the geometry of reservoir scale faults, reservoir scale fractures using unstructured grids. So we may have our big fractures here and our big faults. And then where we can do the upscaling, we could go back to using some dual porosity approaches in selected layers. But we honor the large scale fractures that we um, are at the scale or that span many um, grid blocks using unstructured grids. And we honor the geometry of these fractures. Where well, these approaches work really nice, in my opinion, is if you are in a deterministic framework. So if you have one or two realizations of fracture networks, of reservoir geometry, and you want to spend the time and grid them up and build um, finite element or unstructured grid models. 
you work in a stochastic framework where you need to add fractures, you have different realizations of fractures, you may want to move, remove or add fractures, things become very challenging if you want to build a large number of unstructured grid reservoir simulation models. You spend a lot of time building these models and you don't have the time to do 10, 100 um, different realizations. So one opportunity that we can do, and again, this is nothing new that has been around in the literature for uh, many years, and I think the first papers again came out of the Chevron group by around some these, use hierarchical or so-called embedded fracture modeling. And the idea is you work with a standard finite difference grid, a nicely rectangular grid, and then you have all the fractures below the scale of a single reservoir simulation grid block, you homogenize them, you upscale them, use your dual porosity model, and fractures that span um, many or more than one, uh, 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 larger than a single reservoir simulation grid box that spend many reservoir simulation grid blocks, you map them onto your um, classical um, structured grid, you trace the trajectories of your fractures, you look at where the fractures intersect the grid, and then you find some source terms that tell you how fast does the rock matrix interact with these large scale fractures. What is shown is that you can solve these systems very quickly using multi-scale methods, and you don't need complex grids if you want to add new fractures or remove existing fractures. And this is a picture from, um, that comes out of Patrick Jenny's group at ETH Zurich, um, where they compared the hierarchical, the simulations using a hierarchical um, grid with the unstructured gridding approach where the fractures are represented explicitly, that's the pressure field, and they show that you get a very nice agreement between these computationally more costly unstructured gridding approaches and these faster hierarchical grids. Okay, where are we now? So what we discussed is the dual porosity model remains the workhorse for applied reservoir simulation in many cases. The key challenge that we face is that we want to calculate effective fracture permeabilities. It's notoriously difficult to, due to the lack of REV of fracture networks. One opportunity that we have is for single phase flow application, we could use probabilistic approaches to model transport and flow efficiently. The second opportunity, if we have multi-phase flow processes, we can use quote unquote new, they're not really new, they've been around for 15 years, um, new numerical approaches to represent fractures above the scale of a single grid block explicitly and upscale the fractures below the scale of a single reservoir simulation grid block. And what I want to talk about next is how we couple the fractures with the rock matrix in the dual porosity model. The key to this is the fracture matrix fluid exchange, and one key process is um, countercurrent spontaneous inhibition. So what we're looking at is matrix block filled with oil, surrounded by fractures, and the fractures are filled with water, and due to capillary forces, the water imbibes into the rock matrix. That's pretty much like putting a sugar cube into a cup of coffee where the coffee imbibes due to capillary forces into the sugar cube that's filled with air and air is a non-wetting phase. So you can model this um, using this transfer, using a very simple real, um, equation. The transfer is equal to the shape factor that tells us something about the size and the form of the matrix block. The transfer rate beta, which tells us how fast the processes happen, that depends on the permeability and the fluid properties of the rock matrix, the fluid properties, capillary pressure relative permeability. The average water saturation, the average maximum water saturation or wetting phase saturation that they can have in the rock matrix, and the average wetting phase saturation at a given point in time in the rock matrix. You can do very nicely, you can do some experiments where you try to um, work out what this beta parameter is. And what has been shown, if you do in these experiments, you simply plunk a block of rock into a beaker filled with water and you look, measure how fast does, for example, the oil that's in the rock comes out. You measure the oil at the top here. And what you know from this experiment, the wettability, permeability, matrix surface area are key components that define you um, how fast the transfer happens. The easy bit is the higher the permeability of the rock matrix, the larger the beta, the faster the transfer port. The larger the shape factor, the bigger the surface area, the faster the transfer. The more difficult bits are, what is, how do we deal with fluid viscosities or the wading, invading defending phase? And how do we deal with wettability? Generally, the less water wet, the slower the transfer rate. And the slower means by orders of magnitude, slower transfer rate and lower overall recovery. 
The first experiments were done back in 1918. It was the first transfer rate coefficients were developed back in 1918. Since then, about 50 different transfer rate coefficients have been proposed using um, experimental data. The problem that we face now is, in some cases, these transfer rate coefficients work nicely. In other cases, they don't work. So it's recovery of oil against non-dimensional time. We non-dimensionalize time using real time and the transfer rate coefficient in one frequently used formulation. And what this non-dimensionalization does us is that, what it does is that at any given non-dimensional time, you should have the same recovery. Because if processes happen fast because permeability is high, that means we reach, say, 20% recovery a short time, but at the same time, the transfer rate coefficient is far high. If you have process happen slowly because the transfer rate um, um, is low because we have low permeability, well, it just takes longer time to reach the same amount of recovery. Look carefully, all these blue dots, they sort of follow about the same line, and this is because this is the data for which this beta ma, the ma coefficient, was developed. But then there are other data. This Triangles and the stars weigh orders of magnitude off in your predictions. Another challenge is that um, we have strong variability in matrix properties at scales below a single grid block. So again, this, you've seen this picture before. We have matrix blocks that are quite large, others that are quite small. So the surface area changes at the scale, uh, the matrix surface area changes at the scale below a single reservoir simulation grid block. And likewise, this is real data from a reservoir, permeability against porosity, and plotted on this is the wettability of the rock, over 20 meters of a well in a carbonate reservoir. So it's well below the scale of a simulation grid block. And we have about, what's it, three, four orders of magnitude variation permeability, and we have everything from oil wet to water wet rocks. So extreme variations in matrix properties over short scales. Another challenge is this very nice work from Tony Kovchek's group here at Stanford University. We have taken a little block of rock filled um, with air, and they put it in contact with water, so this is a fracture. And they visualized using X-ray CT how the, water, how the um, waterfront imbibes into the rock matrix. And you can nicely see that you get gradients in water saturation in the rock matrix. So we have non-uniform water set, um, distributions, so non-uniform saturations in the rock matrix. So we have a lot of heterogeneity in the rock matrix that we somehow need to average. What can we do? We can go back to ideas from probabilistic solute transport modeling. And what you see here is concentration against time for a tracer test um, in a fractured dolomite in New Mexico. The dots are the data, and the um, lines are the predictions using a classical dual porosity model. You can see that model and predictions, uh, data and model predictions disagree. If you use a classical dual porosity model, we try to average the properties. You simply give yourself um, a little bit more flexibility and say, rather than taking the total transfer, somehow the average transfer, we say, we take it the sum of all individual transfer processes, so transfer processes that happen because parts of the matrix are very permeable, other parts of the matrix are impermeable. Do this, the very nice agreement of the model prediction and the data. You can do this for multi-phase flow processes as well. Again, unstructured grid simulation, fractures, some oil at two different times. The circles are the simulations. The green line is we use multiple transfer rates. We use average transfer rates. We underpredict early time, overpredict late time. If we give more weight to larger or smaller matrix blocks, we're completely off. So the multi-rate dual porosity model, it's simple in theory and practice. Each reservoir simulation grid block is more than one transfer function if needed. It's very easy to implement. It's very fast. Individual tracer uh, transfer functions account for the distribution matrix block size and permeability and wettability. The nice thing is the relevant data is already available from standard modeling workflow. We already have the data when we build our reservoir models. We tend to throw it away. The other opportunity that we have is we can revisit the physics of spontaneous inhibition which is a nonlinear diffusion problem. So again, this is a laboratory experiment that we, um, people at the Peer College did and that we analyzed, where you have a waterfront that imbibes into rock and displaces air. And you see it at a different time where the waterfront imbibes. And if you plot the profiles of the water saturation, the function of the similarity variable for diffusion, you see that you get a nice agreement um, that, that all curves overlap. If you, Find, if you take the analytical solution 
for this nonlinear diffusion process that describes how the water front imbibes or wetting phase imbibes into the rock matrix, you find the analytical solution for this, then you get a very nice agreement between the black curve, between the analytical solution and the experimental data. So you can back to, go back to some mathematics and find the right analytical solutions. What you can then do is we can say, well, we go back to, again, this probabilistic transport modeling. In each matrix block, we take the memory function as a fun, uh, memory function, so the probability that something is going to move as a function of time. We pick out the right memory function to model um, diffusion in a rock matrix block. So here you see memory functions for capillary countercurrent flow, compared in blue, and the um, compared with memory functions for a finite slab or a truncated power law. So you can use these memory functions to model diffusion in the rock matrix. We do this, again, simulation with unstructured grids. You can sort of barely make out where the fractures are. They're filled with water, and the oil saturation is um, higher in the rock matrix. We measured the saturation as a function of time at the outlet of this geometry. The green is the data, so the simulated um, oil saturation as a function of time. If we use this approach, we take a memory function to model diffusion in the rock matrix. A very nice agreement, you now upscale model between model and data. We can also take this a step further and say, we actually define a universal rate um, coefficient for spontaneous imbibition. We realized this um, a few years ago that from the analytical solution for spontaneous imbibition, you can define this beta parameter independently of any rock fluid or um, a, a rock and fluid system. And if we plot no recovery as a function of non-dimensional time using this universal transfer rate, and what you see is that all data starts to collapse onto not sort of a perfect line, but more of a slow, um, more of sort of a tube of, of um, data points. The reason why you don't get perfect collapses in some cases, the authors didn't report what the, wet, uh, what the capillary pressure or relative permeability curves were, so we had to make some estimates what they were. But it's not, uh, no longer orders of magnitude variation in the um, recoveries as a function of time, but um, um, perhaps a factor of five or so by which we could reduce, or we could reduce the uncertainty by a factor of five. There are two key points that I want to highlight on this graph. The first one is this purple curve is our prediction from the analytical solution, and that matches of the early time behavior quite nicely, but then at late time, we're going to be off because that just continues to grow. We take another model, we say, well, we model the recovery by some exponential model, we are under predicting early time, but we're getting quite good at matching the late time behavior. If you look very carefully, there's sort of a region where the two curves are very close to each other. And this is sort of almost hot of the press. What we really realized about two weeks ago is that you can make a sound physical and sound mathematical argument to match the analytical solution and combine the analytical solution with a late time solution. So you, can, you know exactly when you need to switch from the analytical solution to the late time solution. To walk you through the different plots or graphs or curves on this plot, so the blue curves are an analytical solution that continues to grow at late time. The purple curve is the exponential model that under predicts what happens at early time, but gets the late time behavior really reasonably well. The red curve is a numerical simulation that tracks, we see that it tracks exactly what happens at early time, but then at late time, the analytical solution and the um, um, numerical solution disagree, but then we're getting reasonably close to the exponential model. So what we've worked, or we think we have worked out, is when we need to switch from the analytical solution to the late time model to capture both early time behavior and late time behavior properly. So I'm close to finish. You know, um, so where we are now is, again, we're still working with the dual porosity model. The key challenge, another key challenge is that we need to include very complex matrix heterogeneities in our transfer functions. Matrix heterogeneities could be variations in wettability, matrix permeability, block sizes, distributions of water saturate, or, or sat more generally saturation in rock matrix. Opportunity one is, again, we go back to our friends from groundwater hydrology and we use some ideas about probabilistic transport modeling, allow for distribution of transport rates, uh, transfer rates in a dual porosity model. 
opportunity to us, we go back to the fundamental physics of spontaneous inhibition, include nonlinear diffusion in the matrix using appropriate analytical solutions, for example, memory functions or an analytical solution for the transfer um, rate coefficient. I should point out that you can make the same arguments about gravitational displacement, so vertical displacement for this, um, for in the second opportunity. The two last slides I want to show is what I think where the future lies. It's one big opportunity, and as I'm certainly discussed here at this conference, is uncertainty quantification, clustering model, ranking robust optimization. So what I've talked about are sort of these uncertainties in how we simulate the, um, the um, fractured reservoir. So things of how we upscale the fractured reservoirs, how we make sure that we get the right physical processes. Now there's a lot of geological uncertainty. How well connected are our fractures? How does the matrix look like? What is the permeability of the fractures, um, of the individual fractures? So what we want to do is, ideally, build a number of different realizations for the fractures, a number of different realizations for the rock matrix. If we were to simulate these now all in full physics simulations with black oil or compositional or non-isothermal models, it takes a lot of time to do. There's a lot of interesting work now how we can use design of experiments, proxy models, flow diagnostics to map out and get some responses of, say, how the recovery of oil changes as a function of time. Considering that we have different geological realizations of fractures of the rock matrix, different simulation approaches, and then define um, a proximity matrix that just tells us how closely the different realizations are. And then we combine this proximity matrix with a multidimensional scaling to see how closely the model responses are related to each other. Then we apply some clustering to say, well, this region corresponds to a certain fracture network, the green region corresponds to a different fracture network. And rather than running everything in a full physics reservoir simulation with lots of effort, we then carefully pick out a representative model from the blue region, from the green region, etc. We apply to a full physics simulation. We get a good idea of how variable the behavior of our fractured reservoir is, rather than honing in and jumping to one single model. The last, the next opportunity is the geomechanics for fractured reservoirs. This goes back to giant, uh, science geoscience 2011 um, in Wilmington, in Long, or the Wilmington oil field in Long Beach. We have fantastic subsidence. These are the wellheads. This is how much your reservoir is compacted. This is another example, the Ecofisk field, where they realized that something bad is happening when they had not longer, no longer these five to six holes in their platform, but suddenly only four holes, and they realized the entire platform was disappearing in, this, in the North Sea. These are unfractured reservoirs, but they're nice examples that reservoirs can really compact under, under production. In other case, we want to stimulate fractures, geothermal reservoirs, shale um, gas, shale gas um, unconventional reservoirs. We want to induce fractures before production. What's very important is that fracture permeability, fracture connectivity, they're very stress sensitive. We change as we change the reservoir stresses. We may even create earthquakes. And Ruben Johannes um, gave a very nice talk this morning who showed um, how we can use novel modeling techniques to at least quantitatively understand what could be happening. I think there's a lot more research to do what is the best way to model these processes, how to link compaction with um, or, or geomechanics with flow in fractured reservoirs. To conclude, Niels Bohr has this fantastic quote, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. I think that's true for fractured reservoirs. I think Modeling techniques that we have available in commercial simulators, they don't really have changed since the 1980s. We still struggle with a lot of the same challenges. I think also that there are many opportunities how we can improve modeling and simulation now. They are available now where academia and groups like this here, the science geosciences, they have made significant progress. We just need to use them and it's very nice to see that um, Companies like Chevron and Bradley Mallison has done some really nice work where they've picked up some of these ideas and implemented them in at least research-grade reservoir simulators. I think we need to go back to the physics and geology. We want to make sure that our models capture first-order controls at the relevant scales. And I think there are a lot of exciting um, challenges and opportunities ahead of us, robust optimization, geomechanics, and things like X-ray CT visualization. We cannot for example, visualize how fractures open and closing in real time as we change the fluid pressures using computer, um, um, X-ray computer tomography. They really allow us to get new insights into the key physics, bring them up, up, start to upscale them into larger scale models and make sure 
that we predict key physics and the key geological, uh, that we include the key physics and the key geological behaviors into our reservoir simulation models. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and many people, that is not work I did on my own, many people, collaborators, postdocs, PhD students, funding agencies have supported the work over many years in the past. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Sebastian. Uh, we'll allow for a few questions. Uh, please state your name and affiliation clearly. And if you don't want to ask your question now, Sebastian will be here at uh, four o'clock where we have this meet the speaker session where you can ask more questions then. So. Okay, if there are no questions, then I think there's, we, I think there, right. there's a question. Oh, oh Lou, please go ahead stand between everyone in a coffee break, so I'll, I'll make it a, a, a quick question. Yeah, Lou Drulovsky enj enjoyed the talk, Sebastian. Thank you. Um, yeah, so you've kind of worked to, um, you know, build analytical solutions into these transfer functions, you know, which is a great approach. Um, a different approach that, that we've more pursued is sort of resolving that um, matrix porosity and then kind of just adding degrees of freedom and modeling it. Um, so I wonder if you've looked at all of at, at that sort of an, an approach or if you see some um, maybe a sweet spot in combining uh, those two sorts of treatments. Um, that's a really good question and the short answer for those who want to go to coffee is yes, we looked at this and we've done some work. And I was I'm, I'm well aware and I was thinking I had a slide and to discuss that discusses some of your work, but due, due to time that fell, fell out. But yes, you can do this and I think Combining both is really the, the key way to go forward, where you have the extra degrees of freedom in the rock matrix, and you combine them with analytical transfer functions. You would have something like the multi multi rate models, multiple regions, sub regions in your matrix, plus multiple transfer rates that are based on analytical solutions of the physics. And I think that's, that's a really, really, to me, that's the way to go forward. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the concurrent session starts again in 10 minutes. So thank you very much, Sebastian.